Robert Fisher, president of Gonzaga University in Spokane, Washington for 10 years, from 1998 to 2008, and did wonderful work there, achieving great things in the academic life and spiritual life of the students. He oversaw a turnaround on campus. Enrollments at the Jesuit University it rose from 4,500 to 6,900 while he was there. Of course, the basketball team achieved great things with him at the University of Chicago, too. Gonzaga enjoyed the run of the top 25 basketball team in NCAA tournament bids. Father Spitzer grew up in Honolulu, Hawaii, and then went to Gonzaga University for his undergraduate years, followed by postgraduate work at St. Louis University, the Gregorian University of Rome, Western School of Cambridge, and the Catholic University of, of America in Washington, D.C. Father Spitzer is a Top tier scholar who has published both academic and popular treatments of fundamental questions like happiness, freedom, time, creation, and the right to life, as well as business, business ethics, and even accounting. The breadth of this man's contribution can be seen in the title of the video series he has done with EWTN Healing the Culture, the Spirit of Catholic Leadership, Suffering, and the Love of God. Finding God through faith and reason, five pillars of the spiritual life, and Jesus Emmanuel. His newest book is called New Proof for the Existence of God, Contributions of Contemporary Physics and Philosophy. Father Spencer will try to have you on campus this fall to talk about astrophysics and creation. Your talk comes at a great time on this campus. Last spring, Cardinal Christoph Schoenborn yeah. raised challenging issues in his lecture here titled. Pope Benedict, Regensburg, and the Controversy of Creation and Evolution. That lecture sparked a discussion on campus that I suspect will begin again today after you speak. We also come to Benedict in college at a time when our renewal as a community of faith and scholarship is getting greater notice. First Things Magazine, studying the school's social, religious, and academic elements, identified us as the top 20 school in the country. We feel blessed to be recognized by both U.S. News and World Report and the Cardinal Newman Society as one of the top schools in the country also. Things have been going so well here at Benedict. We're proud to be proud of one of our current facilities in our building a new academic center that will house our theology and philosophy department. And as I am proud to say, it will have the most state-of-the-art philosophy building in the free world. <laughs> <laughs> at the center of the exciting renewal here at Benedict College is our embrace of faith and reason. That Benedict College will see the not as warrior conception of reality, but as partners in the pursuit of truth. Very appropriate that you join our speaker series, which was named after the author of the encyclical Faith and Reason, Pope John Paul III. Thank you, Father, for your contribution to Catholic life in America and intellectual life in the Academy. We're truly honored to welcome you to Benedict College campus. Please accept this commemoration of your place. In our John Paul the Great, the Secret Speaker Series. Let's give a warm welcome to Father. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. Oh, no, it's my pleasure. <laughs> So honored to be with all of you this evening and thank you for such a warm welcome and I have had a warm welcome from the moment I not only stepped onto the campus but uh, the minute uh, Matt and Darren met me at the airport it's just been absolutely wonderful and of course uh, all of the Benedictine fathers here have been just so very very gracious uh, to me especially uh, uh, during the liturgy and and with their hospitality which is a great Benedictine virtue uh, tonight, I just wanted to speak with you about uh, the new atheism. Uh, I think uh, many of you are probably familiar with Stephen Hawking's work, uh, The Grand Design, and you might be wondering, uh, what's all this about? Um, um, you might be wondering, uh, why is it that uh, Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens have uh, such a, a large sway uh, in uh, contemporary media? Um, do they really hold the truth about uh, science and faith, or are there other opinions? 
Um, and for those of you who watched uh, the Larry King uh, show the other day, I, I certainly voiced my disagreement with uh, uh, Stephen Hawking and very much uh, voiced my disagreement too with Richard Dawkins and uh, Leonard Mladenov. Uh, but it is not just me. I'm just completing a documentary right now for cable television um, that features Nobel Prize winning physicists and Templeton uh, Award f uh, physicists who are talking about the evidence for God and creation. And we're going to talk a little bit about that evidence uh, this evening. Um, in fact, the evidence is so prolific, really, uh, that uh, I've written uh, this new book uh, that um, uh, was just mentioned. and. Uh, the new book uh, tries to give a summary of some of the uh, important evidence that's come to light about science and faith in the last 20 years, particularly in the last 20 years. I wanted to also address what Stephen Hawking is saying in the grand design because obviously he takes a counter position uh, to the physicists who have worked with me on the documentary and to many other physicists who I will be mentioning tonight. And we want to understand, well, what is it uh, there that, uh, that is the source of the debate? And then if you want, uh, in the question and answer session, we can take up all kinds of things uh, regarding, uh, you know, the biblical account of creation, if you will, versus the scientific one. Uh, indeed, if there is a contradiction, and I don't believe that, uh, you know, the Bible was doing science per se, and we can talk about that. Um, I could, would also love to talk to you about evolution or whatever other kind of questions that might be on your mind that are not covered in this talk. What's the first uh, critical propedeutic point? Uh, really, anything can change in science. You can't prove God scientifically in the same way you can prove God philosophically. Because science is based on induction, and because of that, we can never be sure that we have a complete explanation of the universe from within the context of physics itself. There could be a new discovery, which could change your whole model. After all, that's been done three or four times at least in the course of intellectual history. So, for sure, you cannot prove something absolutely with science. But science can indicate the, not only uh, the existence of, of a creator outside of space-time asymmetry, uh, science can also come up with rigorous theories to that effect. And we do want to give some assent to that evidence and to those rigorous theories, uh, so long as the evidence keeps piling up from many different directions and keeps amalgamating, as it were, all leading to the same set of numbers, all leading to the same set of calculations, all of a sudden that theory becomes rigorous. The evidence becomes more and more rigorous, and we can, in a sense, give some assent to that evidence um, with the condition, with the caveat, that things could change. There are, as we will see in a moment, there are other interpretations that can be given to the evidence. We'll talk about the multiverse theory, um, and, and whether or not it gives us a, a good explanation of anthropic coincidences. So science is not going to prove the existence of God like philosophy does. But at the same time, it can, using John Henry Cardinal Newman's terms, science can, through amalgamating or looking at the confluence of antecedent probabilities. In other words, it looks at the probability for a, a beginning from this entropy, the probability of a beginning from the vantage point of what we'll call space-time geometry. And, and then we'll take a look at anthropic coincidences that are very, very difficult to explain by pure chance or random occurrence. And we begin to, we begin to, to amalgamate all of these things and said to John Henry Newman, after a while, the confluence of these antecedent probabilities begins to form rigorously established evidence, particularly if they're explained from the same set of equations or numbers. And it's there that science can really give us a clue, a clue perhaps to the existence of a creator but one that is not going to be something that is metaphysical in the sense of philosophy that can tell us as a conclusion to an argument that God therefore exists. By the way, I do present three of those arguments in this book. They're philosophical arguments, but that's quite a different matter from what we'll do tonight. 
With that caveat in mind, well, what are the, the kinds of evidence, the, the, the kinds of data that have been used in the last 20 years to ascertain, contrary to the new atheism, that there is a strong likelihood of a creator, in fact, of a superintelligent creator that is outside of universal space-time asymmetry or even outside of a multiverse, if indeed a multiverse does exist. Let's go through and take a look at three groupings of evidence. Uh, because I'm, I'm going to limit myself to a kind of a 45-minute explication of this so I can get a good amount of time for questions and answers from you tonight, I'm, I'm going to really uh, not cover the entropy arguments uh, as, as much as I, I might in, in, in another forum. But I do want to mention them because they do point, in a sense, to the same uh, kinds of conclusions. But let's go through them. Number one, space-time geometry arguments for a beginning. Number two, entropy arguments for a beginning. And number three, anthropic coincidences that do point to supercalculating superintelligence behind the fine-tuning of the universe. Fine-tuning, by the way, is a physics term, not a philosophy term. It's used frequently to refer to these anthropic coincidences, which I'll be talking about. So what are the space-time geometry arguments? Just a quick background on where this came from. It comes ultimately from Albert Einstein, who came up with the general theory of relativity. And derived from the general theory of relativity is something about space-time that's very, very important. Space-time's not an empty vacuum. It's not a void. Space-time is a highly dynamic field. It interacts with mass energy. It warps, it vibrates, and reconfigures itself according to the density of mass energy in it. This is not the, the space-time uh, of Isaac Newton. It, it is the space-time that is a dynamic field that is unifying the entire universe, or in the case of a multiverse, could even unify a multiverse with all kinds of bubble universes in it. But the point is, space-time is dynamic. It has properties, and therefore we can make predictions from them. Some of the predictions that came to light in 1980 by none other than Stephen Hawking himself, along with another physicist, Roger Penrose, was the first singularity theorems. And during that time, uh, they predicted that there was a singularity that almost evoked infinite curvature of the space timelines, which, to make a long story short, points to a beginning of the universe, a point prior to which there would not be a physical event. That singularity theorem was based on five conditions, and one of the conditions was that the pressure of matter not become negative, that is to say repulsive. But later, uh, there was another American physicist by the name of Alan Guth, who uh, came up with what was called the inflationary theory, uh, a theory which is now very well accepted in the universe. And in the inflationary theory, uh, the key thought is that the universe experienced uh, exponential expansion in a very cooled state for a short period of time and probably is continuing today to be in this inflationary state, experiencing this exponential expansion uh, today. What it essentially means is that the universe will not collapse in upon itself. It will continue to expand until it reaches near thermodynamic equilibrium in many, many billions of years from now. What's the point, though, that uh, I'm trying to make here? It violated the third condition of the Hawking-Penrose proof, which seemed to suggest for a second that the universe didn't have to have a beginning. It didn't have to have this singularity, or what's called an initial singularity, at its uh, point, the point at which it came into existence. However, this came to a speedy end, when in 1993, two other physicists, 
by the name of Arvin Borda, an, an Indian physicist, and another physicist by the name of Alexander Vilenkin, born in Russia, but uh, came to the United States and, of course, has been at Tufts University, uh, running an important institute at Tufts for a long time, came together and collaborated on a new theory. A and basically, they came up with another proof a proof of a singularity, a proof of the beginning of the universe, which included the inflationary hypothesis. And for a while there, it seemed like that 1993 proof, which was based on five conditions, that proof itself uh, seemed to hold sway for a long, long time. And in fact, it still holds sway today. There's one loophole that's possible, which is called the weak energy condition loophole, but that loophole really does not apply to this universe or any multiverse which this universe could be attached to. The important thing to notice about the 1993 proof of Borda and Villenkin is you need a beginning not only of this universe, but you need a beginning of any multiverse in which this universe could be attached and that, the, that um, the, the weak energy condition loophole really doesn't apply to this universe. In fact, Alan Guth himself, the father of inflationary theory, said, I do not consider this, this loophole, this exception, to be important. It's just not applicable. In 1999, Alan Guth went further. This father of inflationary theory, who is now at MIT and holds a very prestigious chair there, also did a very comprehensive study of every model, inflationary model, that could have generated this universe or a universe like it or a multiverse in which this universe could be embedded. And he made the astounding discovery that try as physicists might, this is a direct quote, try as physicists might, they have not been able to identify a single model that does not have to have a beginning, a beginning of the universe or multiverse. That's very interesting. Then in 2003, all three of them came together and they developed another proof. So this is a third one. And now in this particular proof called the, not surprisingly, BVG theorem, the Borda, Vilenkin, and Guth theorem, which was named after all three of them coming together in collaboration, they finally discovered that basically the exponential expansion of our universe or the exponential expansion of a multiverse, remember, every multiverse must be inflationary, if you get the point. Now, multiverses are very speculative things. We don't know if any of them exist. We have no way of gaining access to or evidence for a multiverse. But we can tell you one thing about a multiverse. In order to have a collapse of a false vacuum that would lead to bubble universes, you have to have an inflationary condition. So we know that we're dealing with an inflationary condition. What Board of Lincoln and Guth discovered was this. Any universe or multiverse with only one condition now in this proof, this is the sole condition, with an average Hubble expansion, that means an average rate of expansion greater than zero. It, it doesn't matter how much greater than zero. Any rate of, 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 of expansion greater than zero, sole condition for the proof has to have a beginning. And the reason for this is that the exponential expansion of space in the inflationary condition causes relative velocities in the universe, the relative velocities of everything in the universe, to continue to decrease over the course of time. It's a just, it just flows right out of Hubble's law. And therefore, if you go backward in time, then every relative velocity in the universe will have to get arbitrarily close to the speed of light, which is the highest velocity attainable in this universe or any multiverse to which this universe could be connected, in which case you have to have a beginning. This is a big problem if you don't want to believe in God. <laughs> Why do I say that? It is true to say 
that physics can only get evidence for a beginning. Physics doesn't talk about metaphysical conclusions. They don't talk about creators and creating events. However, metaphysicians like moi can Lit, can talk, it can look at the evidence for a beginning and make a logical extrapolation to a creation from a beginning to a creator from a beginning by just using one single metaphysical premise which we are now going to discuss. But let's just say for a second, Let's say the Board of a Lincoln proof of 1993 is still valid and that every universe and, and multiverse that's in an inflationary condition has to have a beginning, like our universe or a multiverse which our universe could be connected. And let's suppose it is correct that 1999 comprehensive study of Alan Guth is correct and that every model that we develop of an inflationary universe has to have a beginning. And let's suppose uh, for right now that the 2003 BVG theorem the Board of Lincoln and Guth theorem is correct that every single universe or multiverse that has an average Hubble expansion greater than zero will eventually have to have some point, some past time boundary, which ultimately leads to a beginning of the universe or any multiverse. In fact, any oscillating universe in which it could be immersed in every single condition, it would have to have a beginning. If that were the case, what's the big deal for metaphysics? The big deal is the following four propositions, everyone. A beginning of the universe or a beginning of any hypothetical multiverse in which it could be as connected or immersed must constitute the point at which that universe or multiverse came into existence. Get it? Prior to that point, the universe or multiverse was not existing or to put it in a single word was nothing. Thank you. That's the good word. It wasn't there. There was no prior physical event. There was no space-time. There was no space-time coordinate system or field. There was nothing physical. Nothing universal. Just plain nothing. Let's get to premise number two. If the universe was really nothing, and nothing is just nothing, don't sneak anything into nothing. Nothing's not a vacuum. Nothing's not a void. You can't have more or less nothing like you can have more or less of a vacuum or a void. There's just nothing then let's go to the first of all metaphysical premises from nothing only nothing comes it's very simple because nothing is nothing it can only do nothing thank you thank you very much nothing can't do it don't sneak some activity into nothing now Stephen Hawking and I we really disagree on this metaphysical principle I don't disagree with Stephen Hawking's physics at all it's this idea of the universe creating itself out of nothing this is a very troubling thing <laughs> because I know one thing metaphysically from nothing Thank you, Father Parmenides. Only nothing, only nothing comes. Because nothing is nothing. Thank you. Let's get to our third proposition. If the universe could not have created itself out of nothing, then something else has to create it out of its nothingness to make it something because it couldn't have done it for itself. Does everybody get that? And that's something else that had to create it so that it could be something from its nothingness. That something else has to be transcendent. The universe can't, as it were, constitute this entity. This entity has to be independent of the universe. It creates out of nothing. So it's really big. 
He needs really out there. And fourthly, it has to be able to create the universe as a whole. It has to be able to create the universe in its space-time coordinate system. It has to be able to create the universe in its mass energy and its mass energy density. And it has to be able to create the universe with all of its laws and constants. And it has to be able to do this in a single moment. Indeed, to create physical time itself. So it's powerful, let's say. It's got some power. All right. Now that's the metaphysical conclusion. That's why there's a lot of people out there worried about, yike, the evidence for a beginning. Did you ever wonder why did Dr. Hawking have to write a book about explaining the universe creating itself out of nothing? Because he already recognizes the evidence that is coming out of physics from entropy, from the Board of Lincoln and Goose theorem, from the Board of Lincoln uh, proof of 1993, and practically speaking, from other singularity proofs at which he stands at the origin. There's a lot of evidence out there, and I think this worries a lot of people. Now, I just, I just have a bone to pick. I want to go back to the idea of nothing being nothing. Nothing is not a quantum field in a low energy state. That's not nothing. Although that is the notion of nothing propounded by Dr. Hawking and Mladenov in their book, The Grand Design. But that can't be the universe creating itself out of nothing. That's the universe coughing up a bubble universe within a low quantum state, a vacuum fluctuation, which is something. It's something. It's not nothing. Look, I have a bank account. Most of the time, my bank account has zero in it. It's in a very low state of being. Now, because I have a bank account that has a zero balance, doesn't mean I'm talking about nothing. I have an existing bank account, which is in an existing bank. Just like I have an existing state of a quantum field and an existing quantum field which can produce the false vacuum uh, you know, fluctuation that could lead to the creation of a whole universe. But it's not something coming out of nothing. That point was not well made. Just a bone to pick. But there it is. We got a problem. By the way, it's not a physics problem. It's a metaphysics problem. Let's, um, I'm just running a little short on time. Um, I refer you to chapter one of this book for the entropy arguments. You can get them. But just basically, entropy is the natural movement from what we c will call an ordered to a disordered state of energy with, or an order to a disordered system of energy. Ordered systems of energy can do something. Disordered systems of energy progressively get run down and they progressively can't do anything. Ultimately, there are three arguments from entropy. One is the ratio between the cosmic background, microwave radiation, and, and uh, starlight and other higher forms of energy. Another argument is from Tolman's limit. Another argument comes uh, from a guy named Sean Carroll, but the point I'm trying to get to is these entropy arguments are very, very important arguments. And the reason they are is they point to a beginning too. So it's not just space-time geometry arguments like the Board of Lincoln and Guth theorem we just talked about. It's also these entropy arguments that are pointing to the same beginning that has the same metaphysical consequence of a creator that can create the universe as a whole. What I want to get to now is if for a second you grant me that maybe Board of Lincoln and Guth have a point. If you grant me for just a second that there may be significant evidence out there for the beginning of the universe from the vantage point of space-time geometry proofs, then what I'd like to say is I think that powerful creator that created the universe as a whole is really smart. And here's why. Because there are conditions and constants of the universe. 
And some of these conditions are highly, highly, highly improbable. And those conditions, in turn, those highly improbable conditions, are really, really needed in order to have life forms, the sustaining of life forms, and the normal evolutionary development of life forms within a universe. I'm not talking about intelligent design or filling in the gaps. I'm just talking about getting a universe that can get the whole thing started. Let's just take a look at it for just a second. Let's go back to this guy, Roger Penrose. He just did a calculation which was actually very elegant for what are the odds that you would have a low entropy universe? You really want a low entropy universe because a low entropy universe has lots of ordered systems of energy in it that can do all kinds of things like sustain life forms and permit the evolutionary development of life forms, etc. So you really want a low entropy. You don't want a high entropy universe because then you've got a run down universe that has lots of disordered energy and disordered systems of energy which can't do a whole heck of a lot, and we can't do a whole heck of a lot, it quite frankly is not going to be able to sustain a life form over the long term, and certainly not sustain a process of evolution or complexification needed for living beings to develop. So you want a low entropy universe. I'm not going to give you the, if you want to see the actual derivation of the calculation, it's so elegant and so beautiful and so easy, it's right in the book. I'll give you the conclusion. The odds against our low entropy universe Developing by pure chance, you guys, is 10 raised to the 10, raised, once again, to the 123 to 1. A double exponent. Have you ever thought about a double exponent? That's the odds against it. So that means that you take your first 10, and then if you want to reduce that double exponent to a single exponent, you put a 1 followed by 123 zeros after it in the exponent. So the exponent has a trillion, 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 trillion
And that's great. And, and Planck's constant, 1.68, you guys, right? And every one of our, we have four universal forces, right? The gravitational force. And it has a constant. It's a very specific number. And we have the strong nuclear force, and it has a constant, a very specific number. And the weak force has a very specific number constant. And the electromagnetic force has three constants. It has the mass of a proton, the mass of an electron, the charge of the proton and electron. Now, these constants, here's the deal, everyone. They literally control not only the laws of physics, they are controlling the laws of nature. It's not just the equations of physics. It's the laws of nature out there. These constants are really important. Now, here is the rub. If those constants were off by a mere fraction, then we could not have a universe that is capable of sustaining a life form. For example, if the gravitational constant or the weak force constant were off by only one part in 10 to the 50, that's a small fraction, that's a one in, in, in the denominator, a one with 50 zeros after it. It's a teeny fraction, it's a decimal point with 49 zeros and a one. This is higher or lower? If it's off by one, if either of those two constants are off by one part in 10 to the 50, higher or lower, either the universe would have catastrophically exploded, it would have kept on exploding in its expansion. By the way, that would have been very bad for life forms. <laughs> or <clears throat> the universe would have catastrophically collapsed into a Schwarzschild black hole, which would have been really bad for life forms. The alternatives are not good. And we threaded the needle. Isn't that phenomenal luck? Just so happens that we got the right numbers. Oh, here's another one. If the strong force constant varies 2% higher from its, current, from its value, the value it has, you would have no hydrogen in the universe. This is very bad for life forms because you can't have any hydrogen fuel and stars and things like this. Very important for life. Alternatively, if it were just 2% lower, you would have no element on the periodic table heavier than hydrogen, including carbon, which is really bad for life forms. <laughs> Let me just give you a few other examples. I think you're starting to get the point. We're really lucky. Here's another one. I mean, at one juncture, you know, our, our stars lie on the, on, on the very verge of convective instability, right? I mean, they could either be blue giants, which are these huge exploding stars that give off so much radiation, quite frankly, they'll fry anything in sight, which is bad for life forms. <laughs> or the red dwarfs, they're dying stars that literally have not enough radiation to sustain a development of life. But here's the deal. If our uh, weak force constant, if the mass of the electron relative to the mass of the proton or the electromagnetic charge were off by one part in 10 to the 39, higher or lower, every single star in our universe would either be a blue giant or a red dwarf. Again, wow, we're lucking out. It's unbelievable. I'll give you one that converted Fred Hoyle. He's kind of a, you know, Fred Hoyle was always the gadfly, right? He was always the, uh, the primary atheist in physics. And one day his partner, William Fowler, came up to him, at least as the story goes, and said, hmm, Fred, um, take a look at these calculations. And what Fred Hoyle and William Fowler discovered together was the following, that if the, uh, there, there's what we call resonance levels, which lead, as it were, to the stickiness of an atom, uh, and, and then that leads to the stickiness of molecular bonding and so forth. If the beryllium, oxygen, helium, or carbon resonance levels had just been off by a very small fraction, one way or another, higher or lower, either carbon wouldn't have the stickiness it requires for bonding, or there wouldn't be an abundance of carbon at all, in which case it would be really bad for life forms. Now, of course, 
Hoyle looked at this and he was stunned. And he went over it and over it and over it again and finally he came out with this conclusion. I consider it to be beyond the pale of doubt completely that there are no blind forces worth speaking of. Some super intelligence has monkeyed with the constants of physics in order to make them felicitously dovetail so as to get a universe possible for life. I consider this to be beyond the pale of doubt, beyond the shadow of a doubt. Then he later said, the odds of carbon occurring by pure chance in our universe is the same as a tornado sweeping through a junkyard and assembling a Boeing 747. <laughs> Ready to fly. He changed his mind, became a theist. What's my point? No physicist seriously believes that any of this happened by pure chance. So there are two alternative explanations. Nobody believes this could happen by pure chance. Not carbon, not our, uh, uh, our stars being between blue giants and red dwarfs, not the, uh, uh, the strong force constant allowing for the entire per uh, periodic table, not the weak force and gravitational constants preventing the universe from catastrophic explosions or catastrophic collapse. Nobody believes these things happen by pure chance. What are the two explanations? Well, there's Hoyle's explanation, the super-calculating super-intellect infusing the universe with all of the values of the constants necessary in order for it to come out the way it did. The, somebody who snuck into the room with the monkey and did the typing, who had a very good knowledge of Shakespeare or perhaps another volume. Number two, the multiverse. Back to the multiverse again. In other words, we could have billions upon billions of bubble universes, or even in a new iteration called the ensemble, we could have an ensemble of ensembles of bubble universes, and all of these universes could be autonomous enough so that we could, as it were, get a try over, another roll of the dice by pure chance, every single time a bubble universe is created, and if enough bubble universes are generated, if we get 10 to the 10 to the 123 bubble universes generated, eventually, one time the die will turn up, the bubble universe will turn up with the exact constants that we need, with the exact conditions for a low entropy universe in order to have a universe that will be able to sustain a life form. Okay, possibly. But then again, we have to examine the multiverse hypothesis. And at the current time, if you, by the way, if you like physics, you might take a look at a book called The Road to Reality. It's, a very, it's got a lot of equations in it. And it is 1,100 pages by Roger Penrose, but it's really a good book if you, if you get the equations. <laughs> the key thing, though, is he highly criticizes the ensemble multiverse as, frankly, requiring as much fine-tuning as the very phenomenon it's trying to explain. What has been the, frankly, the, what has been the real problem with the multiverse? And I, do, I say this with all due respect. In order to get these uh, bubble universes created in a way that they don't bump into, see, if universes bump into each other, that's bad. Causes a lot of space-time jarring. Everything turns to chaos. Not good. So you have to make sure that the bubbles are not bumping. But in order to make sure that the bubbles are proceeding in a very orderly fashion from random fluctuations of false vacua in the multiverse, you really have to have a lot of fine-tuning in the laws that govern the uh, actual uh, bubbles and, uh, emergence themselves. So we got a problem here, a multiverse of fine-tuning to explain a universe of fine-tuning that leads to the possibility of life. So we pushed back the fine-tuning problem one step 
But it seems right now that the multiverse, it may, may in the future, may be able to do this without the fine-tuning explanations. But right now, multiverses do require considerable fine-tuning, which seems not to answer the question of the pure chance emergence of a universe capable of sustaining life, but instead only pushes it back a step to the fine-tuning necessary for the universe, which in order to explain the fine-tuning by pure chance. Well, let's now talk and conclude with Newman's thought. If we try to take the convergence of antecedent probabilities, so we take all these various sources of evidence and we put them together, if there is some merit to the space-time geometry arguments aboard of Lincoln and Guth, and right now there has been no counter-argument to it that has worked that I know of, or anyone else for that matter, it's not published in any, in any recognizable way, and if the entropy arguments are correct, then if there is a beginning of the universe, and if the multiverse explanations still require considerable fine-tuning in order for the ensembles to occur, then it might be that the most reasonable and responsible explanation is that there is a beginning. That there is a super intelligent creator behind the beginning. Because precisely a beginning implies a creator. Because if there was a beginning, that was the point at which the universe came into existence. And if it's a point at which the universe came into existence, then prior to that point it was nothing. And if it was nothing, then it was nothing. And from nothing, only nothing comes. And therefore it could not have created itself out of nothing. And if it couldn't have created itself out of nothing, then something else which is bigger than it and transcended it had to create it. And I shouldn't say bigger, you know, put scare quotes around that word. That it would have transcended it, have to, of course, create it as a whole. And while it was creating it, it infused it with all those constants and conditions which were necessary for a life form manifesting a super calculating super intelligence. There may well be something very powerful and very smart out there. And the best of what we have in physics may point to it. I certainly believe this in my faith. Certainly don't need physics in order to prove it. But it is interesting to note that something is happening and that the current contention of pop culture atheism today, that science has somehow disproved the need for God in the universe, why that is a very questionable proposition indeed. For quite the contrary seems to be more reasonable and responsible. That's my view. Thank you very much for indulging me. <laughs>